cases. Uh, what would have happened if we'd lost the Dover trial? You know, right now, the Dover trial, we look at that, and that's a great triumph, because the Dover trial not only repudiated intelligent design in the classroom, but he did it in the most strong language, the most powerful language possible, and said how ridiculous all this stuff was, and it's great. But what if we had had a wingnut judge who went the other way? Our, you know, that, the law doesn't settle science. And what we're going to be doing is we're just going to be sitting back and allowing law to also settle public policy, unless we get in there and fight. Another problem that, that's, that I find kind of troubling, it, you know, I call it the Ken Miller effect. Uh, and again, Ken Miller is a great guy. He is a marvelous lecturer. If you can get him up here, you should have him come by and talk. He's, he's, he's marvelous. He's excellent at dissecting the flaws of intelligent design. He's great at rebutting creationists. Uh, but he's also Catholic. And what you will often find when Ken Miller is introduced is this is the big issue. That Ken Miller is a Catholic who is also an evolutionist. That he's somehow actively demonstrating that religion and science are completely compatible. Well, of course, he doesn't because, you know, people are these obstreperous animals who can hold all kinds of conflicting ideas at once. And you can find a person who holds two really bizarre ideas all at once, and it doesn't mean a thing. For instance, the, some of you may have heard of the BTK killer, Mind Torture Kill, a really horrible, evil man who was kidnapping people and torturing them and murdering them, and he was a deacon in the Lutheran Church. Why don't we bring him up here and say, oh, hey, this is evidence that serial murder and religion are completely compatible. <laughs> We, we, we don't. We recognize that that's an aberrant individual who's holding a set of views that are not really representative of the population at large. And I would say the same thing with Ken Miller, that the fact that he's Catholic and that he's a good scientist at the same time does not tell us that religion and science are compatible at all. What it just tells us is that people can hold incompatible ideas all at once. And unfortunately what happens is, is, I think this is, I think this is bad for Ken Miller as well. Uh, Ken Miller is introduced as, as this representative of Catholicism accepting evolution, and uh, that's what he's became, becoming famous for. I'd be kind of horrified to be famous for being a Catholic. I mean, any idiot can be a Catholic. You know, they, they don't have admission requirements. At least not IQ requirements, okay? So th that's, that's not such a big deal. And at, this, at the same time, what's happening is it's, it's presenting this idea that this compatibility between religion and science is the way it should be. And you'll often find things like people presenting Ken Miller as a perfect example, and then treating somebody like Richard Dawkins, who's an atheist and a scientist, as a pariah. Somebody that should not be up there representing, it, representing the field because he's going to scare away all the good Christians in the country. Uh, when Richard Dawkins is actually pretty much more representative of the standard scientific way of thinking than is Ken Miller. Or as was mentioned earlier, Collins, Francis Collins. Who, you know, every scientist I've talked to about Francis Collins says, yeah, he's a, he's a great lab administrator, and boy, was he, did he go off the deep end with that book. That was a very strange book. Okay. So, you know, what's, what's really happening is that we're, we're busy protecting this classroom and ignoring the culture that it's embedded in. And that's a disaster, because the culture is changing, and it's not changing in a good way. And it doesn't matter how well defended that classroom is, is, is if, you, if you let the barbarians overwhelm the rest of the culture, they're going to be there at the gate, and they're going to crash through eventually. One of those court cases will be lost, and we're gone. There will be nothing we can do. We'll be setting new precedents, and then we won't be able to rely on the court cases anymore. And then I do not know what Americans United and National Center for Science Education will do if suddenly this major strategy is removed from the armament. Okay, so what are we going to do about religion? Like I said, religion is, is the heart of the problem. So there's the compatibilist view that I just told you about. We'll say, okay, well, we're going to try and accommodate them, we'll try and get along with them, and we'll see if we can survive. We'll see if we can win them over gradually to our side. Um, I'm, I'm on the militant side, and this is what I say, is that what we have to do is we have to start fighting back. That 
atheists, secular humanists, ag agnostics, all you rationalists out there need to get up off your butts and start screaming and yelling and telling these people that they're nuts. We've got to get them to back off. That we've got to get out there and vote, we've got to get out there and organize, we've got to get out and do all these things to try and correct the problems. Now, I, I say this sort of thing to people and, they, and the standard response is, oh, you'll never win that way because you'll just turn people off. They will just refuse to listen to you if you are militant about godlessness. If you insist that, that religion does say things, or I mean that science does say things about the existence of God, that it's not very likely that God described it by most Christians actually exists, that what you'll do is just turn them away. They'll refuse to listen to you. And I say, well, so what? Because they're not listening to you anyway. That, that this is our problem right now, is that anything you do, if you just mention that you are an atheist, you know, you don't have to be in your face about it. If you just mention that you're an atheist, uh, you're going to get cussed out. You're going to be treated as a, as a leper among the group. This is happening all over the place. Uh, some of you may also know about a, a campaign in North Carolina going right now with Kay Hagan and Elizabeth Dole, uh, where Elizabeth Dole is sending out campaign literature where she is using as a weapon against her political opponent, opponent the fact that she once went to a party which was also attended by somebody who was an atheist. <laughs> I know, it's terrible, isn't it? That, that this taint is sufficient. So I'm saying to you, well, then if they're going to if they're going to damn you for this, you know, might as well be hanged for a sheep as for a lamb. Go ahead and get in their face. That it's not going to make any difference in their attitudes toward you, except that maybe they'll recognize that maybe you will be willing to fight back, which is something kind of important. This is something we all learned in grade school: is that you know, if you've got a bully, the answer is not to cower and hide and give him your lunch money; it's to stand up to them. You know, not, not resorting to violence yourself, but being strong in your beliefs. Saying, well, no, I'm not going to give you my lunch money. I'm going to go talk to the principal about this. That's the right strategy to take. And too often, we fold. We've got to stop doing that. Uh, one example of, of some horrible stories that were spread around recently. Um, last spring, you know, this, this movie came out. I was involved in it to some tiny extent. Uh, <laughs> But I, I want to make the case that, that what I did here was, was part of this strategy. Now, when this movie, this, this is a movie that was, uh, that used a bunch of interviews from various scientists, people like me and Eugenie Scott and Richard Dawkins, et cetera, that were obtained under false pretenses, uh, that was making a false argument, uh, that, was, that was terribly badly made and so forth. Some of you have seen it, I haven't, but maybe some of you. It, it, it's, it's a terrible movie, and when this, when we first discovered this, which was, oh, let's see, back in August, not this last August, but the August before, uh, I had several conversations with people like Eugenie Scott and others, and the initial response from a lot of people was, well, then what we have to do is we have to be very quiet about it. That what we should do is just ignore them, and they will go away. That if we pay attention to them, it will just feed what they're after. That will be feed their PR machine. It will bring them money. It will make them make you know controversy sells. So we've got to avoid this at all costs. And I'm afraid I was a little bit of a loose cannon. I said no. I said we're we're I'm going to fight. That what we're going to do is we're going to make a stink. That our goal is not simply to sit back and quietly hope this movie disappears. That it vanishes from public consciousness. What we have to do is something a little bit more active. We want to get out there and make people know that this movie is made by a gang of liars and that all of its claims are false. We want to make them known as a gang of complete idiots who got it all wrong and we want to really screw with their reputation. And right from the beginning, I admitted that you know, what we're going to do is we're going to start controversy and we're going to make them a little money because people will go see this movie just because it's controversial. And we don't care. They're not in this to make money. They did not make this movie to make money. They made this movie to influence popular culture. And the only way we can fight back is by influencing popular culture ourselves. So some of you got a little tired of the blog because there were quite a few posts I made where I pointed out all the inconsistencies and the lies they were making and their claims about this movie and so forth. 
Uh, and we were pushing it really hard. Uh, but 